The mysterious kings of the sea, sharks, have flourished for a very long time. These ancient predators are often misunderstood as marvels of evolution, perfectly adapted to their aquatic realm. Sharks move effortlessly through the water thanks to their streamlined, torpedo-shaped bodies and enhanced senses. Yet despite their fearsome reputation, most sharks pose little threat to humans, embodying the often overlooked harmony between nature's raw power and its inherent beauty. Here are six stories. San Diego, California, renowned for its bright beaches and abundant marine life, saw the summer of 1999. This coastal city was surrounded by the Pacific Ocean, which drew millions of visitors yearly. The Pacific Marine Aquarium was one of the most visited sites close to the coast. This facility was home to hundreds of marine animals, including a sizable shark exhibit that recently expanded to include several new species, including the elusive sand tiger shark. Smugly claiming to be among the safest locations for up-close views of marine predators, the aquarium took great pride in its sophisticated security measures. Seven-year-old Sophie Fleming went to the aquarium with her family on a typical day. Her parents, Malcolm and Evelyn Fleming, promised Sophie a day full of aquatic wonders. Like many other kids her age, Sophie was enthralled with sharks. Their sleek, muscular bodies had enthralled her when she had read about them in books. The exhibit, Predators of the Deep, was the highlight of the aquarium, and Sophie could barely contain her excitement. That day, a lot of people were visiting the aquarium. Along the various exhibits strolled families, school groups, and marine enthusiasts. The shark tank was the biggest and most striking in the entire structure. Visitors could walk around the whole perimeter of the enormous, thick, reinforced glass cylindrical structure. Numerous shark species leisurely glided their motions, both elegant and ferocious. Rocky outcrops, artificial reefs, and even a submerged tunnel to give visitors the impression that they were strolling through the ocean depths were all part of the exhibit designed to replicate their natural habitat. There was a technical malfunction that day, but the guests were unaware. Due to an ongoing heat wave, the city's power grid has been fluctuating pushing the backup systems of the aquarium to their limits. Engineers had been laboring in the control room all morning, attempting to maintain the water quality in the tanks and stabilize the filtration systems. However, none of this was apparent to the guests, who carried on having a good time without realizing the underlying problems. Sophie, her eyes wide with wonder, pressed her face against the glass of the shark tank. The animals inside mesmerized her. Talking about their next trip to the aquarium, her parents were standing a short distance behind her. The lights started to flicker for the first time at that point. An electrical blackout momentarily enveloped the aquarium, bringing darkness to the entire space. There were whispers and gasps as the emergency lights came on. Almost immediately, the power came back on, and for a brief while, everything appeared under control. However, the brief outage brought a serious problem with the aquarium's water filtration system. The sharks started to respond as their surroundings changed, because they were sensitive to them. The usually crystal clear water in the tank turned a little murky, and the sharks seemed agitated. Attendees began moving away from the glass when they noticed the change, feeling something was off. Despite the danger, Sophie couldn't move from her spot. She was enthralled. Abruptly, the aquarium was filled with the loud sound of an alarm. The security systems that regulated the filtration and water levels in the tanks had malfunctioned, and the power outage had occurred once more, albeit with greater severity. A tiny opening just wide enough for someone to squeeze through the safety barrier near the shark tank's observation deck developed during the confusion. Sophie, who had been getting closer to the tank, stumbled. The little girl staggered forward, but her parents missed it because they were preoccupied with the alarms and the mounting panic around them. Sophie fell into the shark tank beneath as the glass railing gave way due to malfunctioning systems and power outages. When everyone in the crowd realized what had happened, they let out a collective scream. Malcolm and Evelyn rushed to the edge of the tank, screaming their daughter's name, but it was too late. Sophie's tiny body was engulfed by the murky water and vanished beneath the surface. Staff at the aquarium leaped to action. Emergency responders and lifeguards trained for similar situations hurried to the scene. 
Now that they were in full flight, the sharks viciously circled the tank, their sleek bodies slicing through the water at an incredible speed. The employees knew they would only have a few minutes to take action before the worst would occur. Technicians in the control room worked feverishly to get the filtration system back on and the tank under control. There was a severe emergency due to the barrier breach, and every second mattered. It was now nearly impossible to see what was happening inside the tank due to the thick water disruption of sediment and debris. A group of divers headed by Dr. Jasper Halloway, an aquarium specialist, were getting ready to enter the tank. Dr. Halloway had spent years studying sharks kept in captivity and was a specialist in marine biology. Ignoring the risks, he also knew that time was running out. Already unsettled by the broken systems, the shark's level of aggression had increased. The water swirled around Dr. Halloway and his group as they lowered themselves into the tank. Sharks approached closer as soon as they noticed the disturbance. The divers examined every inch of the tank looking for Sophie. Their hearts raced as they navigated the dangerous waters because they knew one mistake could mean disaster. Minutes felt like hours as the search continued. The crowd above watched in horror, some praying for a miracle, others holding their breath in anticipation. And then it took place. A little figure was seen by one of the divers entangled in the seaweed close to the tank's bottom. The person was Sophie. Dr. Halloway gestured to the others and they moved fast to remove the unconscious girl from the rubble. Attracted by the disturbance, the sharks closed in as they rose to the surface. The divers pulled Sophie from the water and onto the platform in the nick of time, just to see one of the sharks lunge and snap its jaws, which were only inches from Sophie. In critical condition, Sophie was rushed to the hospital. She was severely injured from the fall as well as the sharks, even though she had miraculously survived the ordeal. The event shocked the neighborhood and sparked concerns about the aquarium's safety procedures. Several families, including the Flemings, sued the aquarium after investigations showed that the power outage and the ensuing equipment failures had been avoidable. The Pacific Marine Aquarium upgraded its systems and implemented more robust safety measures due to the incident to avert similar incidents in the future. Sophie returned home after months of recovery, but the experience had left her emotionally and physically scarred. Initially excited to discover the ocean's wonders, the Fleming family now approached it warily and with fear. The ordeal was a reminder of how important it is to maintain a delicate balance between taming nature's wildness and human curiosity. Record-breaking floods unseen in more than a century struck the Mississippi River Basin in the spring of 2010. The river overflowed its banks due to the Midwest's torrential rains, flooding roads, towns, and fields from Minnesota down to Louisiana. Beyond just devastation, the floodwaters in Holly Bluff, Mississippi, a small village tucked away in the southernmost portion of the river, also brought an unexpected predator that no one had anticipated, bull sharks. The first attack occurred in early May. Garrison Gary Tolliver had lived his whole life by the river. He was a local fisherman checking his traps in the flooded backwaters nearby. Even though he was an experienced fisherman and knew that the river could be unpredictable, nothing had prepared him for what lay beneath its surface that day. The next morning, Gary's boat was discovered upside down amidst the wreckage near the town boundary. The deep, uneven wounds on his body, which confused the local authorities, washed up several miles downstream. They initially thought the flood had only taken another life, possibly as a result of a stray log or other debris. On Gary's legs, however, an odd pattern of wounds revealed a different tale, that of something with teeth. It didn't take long for rumors about the killer of Gary to circulate throughout the community. More animals started to vanish from Holly Bluff's perimeter as the floodwaters gradually receded. Cows, pigs, and even a few stray dogs were turning up dead, their bodies similarly mangled. Fear of an invisible threat lurking in the murky waters overcame the townspeople, who were already shocked by the devastation caused by the flood. At first, thinking there could be sharks in the Mississippi River seemed ridiculous. Catfish, carp, and the occasional alligator were always present in the river, not sharks. Those were creatures of tropical waters not the murky freshwater currents of the Midwest. Nevertheless, as the attacks persisted, Orville Harker, the town's mayor, asked for assistance from local environmental experts. 
University of New Orleans marine biologist Dr. Lennox Cavanaugh was consulted. Since bull sharks were among the few species that could live in salt and fresh water, she studied their behavior in great detail. Moreover, she was aware that in the appropriate circumstances, bull sharks have been known to venture far upriver. It was possible that the rising floodwaters briefly established a link between the upper Mississippi River and the Gulf of Mexico, as Kavanaugh informed the town authorities. Bull sharks are opportunistic hunters who frequently widen their sphere of influence in search of prey during periods of environmental disruption. However shocking, the theory made sense. The sharks could go far inland, where they would not typically be found because the swollen river had formed new inlets and channels. Furthermore, the sharks followed their instincts and stomachs as the floodwaters forced more fish and other creatures into the river. Holly Bluff residents realized they had to take immediate action when they realized bull sharks were now sharing their flooded town. Temporary nets were erected across some of the smaller channels to try and trap the predators, and boats were sent out to patrol the river. However, it was nearly impossible to track the sharks because of the murky water and large debris. Aside from tagging any sharks they could catch, Kavanaugh and her team deployed monitoring stations along the riverbanks. They intended to learn more about the sharks' movements and population using sonar equipment. The outcomes were concerning. After more than a dozen bull sharks had been found within a short distance of the town, it was obvious that the creatures would not be going anywhere anytime soon. After the flood, further damage was done to the town's already precarious economy. People were too afraid to go near the water, which ended Holly Bluff's fishing industry. Schools of fish that often flourished in the calm sections of the river appeared to disappear, most likely eaten or chased away by the sharks that now dominated the environment. And then there was still another disaster. Marla Odell, 16, a local adolescent, vanished while operating an ATV close to the river. Her body was found later that evening horrifically mutilated in a manner consistent with the earlier attacks. This confirmed the town's worst fears. Sharks were now directly threatening anyone near the water, not just animals or unlucky fishermen. A lockdown was imposed on the city. Warning signs were placed along the riverbanks and locals were advised to avoid the water until further notice. But the Mississippi was an integral part of their lives. For many, staying away was not an option. People continued to need to work, and some, like Merle, the cousin of Gary Tolliver, did not think the threat was genuine, labeling it hysteria over a few big fish. Things didn't get better until late June when the floodwaters eventually receded. The sharks appeared to retreat along the river as it retreated to its regular banks. Following weeks of observation, Dr. Kavanaugh's team confirmed that the sharks were tracking the receding floodwaters back toward the Gulf of Mexico. Still, there were a handful of stragglers. A single gigantic bull shark carried out at least three verified attacks that the locals had come to refer to as Old Thunder. Ultimately unable to find its way back to the main river, it became stuck in a shallow backwater pond. The enormous predator was subdued and moved downstream away from the town by Dr. Kavanaugh and her crew using tranquilizers. By late summer, Holly Bluff was beginning to rebuild. Although the land and its inhabitants were still scarred from the flood, life gradually returned to normal. The attacks had ceased, and although some locals continued to be cautious near the river, others returned to their regular lives. Published in scientific journals, Dr. Kavanaugh's study on the bull shark's extraordinary inland voyage illuminated how extreme weather events, such as the Mississippi flood, can change wildlife behavior in unexpected ways. Her research highlighted the need for a deeper comprehension of the global ecosystems impacted by climate change and human activity. On the other hand, the lesson for the people of Holly Bluff was more straightforward. They could no longer take for granted the river they had lived next to for generations, and that nature was unpredictable. Their relationship with the river was irrevocably altered, because the flood had brought more than just water. It had brought a predator. A group of marine biologists from the Ecuador's University of Quito embarked on a vital expedition in the Galapagos Islands in 2005. The group was researching the migratory patterns of hammerhead sharks under the direction of expert marine ecologist Dr. Valeria Mendoza. 
Darwin Island, a tiny remote island in the northern section of the archipelago, was close to their research base. Using satellite tags and underwater cameras, the team had been working non-stop for weeks to track the movements of hammerhead sharks. Their main objective was to learn about these sharks' migratory paths to safeguard them from illicit fishing practices. Dr. Emilio Vargas and Sofia Arenas accompanied Mendoza, two enthusiastic junior researchers who needed more open water expedition experience. The team had been gathering data without many problems, and the island's clear, cool waters appeared calm and predictable. But something changed in the water as they got ready for their last dive of the day. The first indication of trouble came when Emilio saw a giant shadow moving strangely close to their research equipment while keeping an eye on the underwater cameras from the boat. The motions of a small school of hammerhead sharks were monitored by the cameras on the seafloor approximately 30 meters below. It was a different shadow, though much bigger and far more hostile. Dr. Mendoza tensed up as she looked at the screen when Emilio called her over. It was a huge hammerhead the largest they had seen in weeks, whose shadow they identified. It moved in an unpredictable, almost territorial manner. As it circled the camera rig, the shark gave it the occasional head bump. A hammerhead usually avoided proximity to artificial objects, so this behavior was unusual. Although the team had faced hammerheads in the past, none had been as violent as this one. Dr. Mendoza quickly realized that this was a territorial display. The shark was likely a dominant male and saw the research equipment as an intruder in its hunting ground. As the shark's behavior escalated, the team's concern grew. The hammerhead began ramming the camera rig with increasing force. Their expensive and essential research equipment was in grave danger of being lost. Sophia hesitated as she was getting the diving equipment ready. If the shark could do that to the camera, what could it do to them? Dr. Mendoza understood that they couldn't just call off the dive. They required manually retrievable data in the camera's memory banks. Weeks of arduous labor would be lost if the equipment was destroyed. Nevertheless, they couldn't take a chance by jumping into the water while a hammerhead shark was in the area. Dr. Mendoza swiftly devised a strategy by utilizing her extensive experience. She knew hammerheads were highly sensitive to electrical signals in the water, often mistaking them for prey. The camera rig powered by a small battery could emit signals agitating the shark. They needed to cut the power to the equipment before attempting to retrieve it. Emilio, who had some experience with electronics, volunteered to cut the power remotely. After a tense few minutes of adjusting the controls from the boat, the camera rig powered down. The lights on the screen flickered off, and after a few more tentative bumps, the shark seemed to lose interest. It swam off into the deeper waters, disappearing from view. With the immediate threat seemingly neutralized, Dr. Mendoza gave the go-ahead for a quick dive. She and Sophia donned their gear and descended carefully into the water, keeping a wary eye on the surrounding environment. The water was eerily quiet with only the faint hum of the ocean currents breaking the silence. As they approached the camera rig, the damage was obvious. One of the arms had been bent and several sensors had been knocked loose. Dr. Mendoza worked quickly to detach the memory banks while Sophia kept watch. Every shadow in the water seemed to take on an ominous shape, but the hammerhead did not return. After what felt like an eternity, they surfaced with the data intact. Emilio helped them back onto the boat, and the team breathed a sigh of relief. Although the shark had scared them, they could recover their important information without harm. The encounter gravity started to set in once we were back on land. The Galapagos Islands were incredibly beautiful, but they were also dangerous and untamed. For Dr. Mendoza, the episode was a sharp reminder of the precarious equilibrium between nature and humans. The hammerhead was only defending its territory and had not attacked out of malice or hunger. After considering the experience, the group realized that there were risks associated with their work. They were trespassing into the territory of animals that had spent millions of years roaming the seas. Respect for these animals was not just important for safety. It was essential for the success of their research. Ultimately, their collected data contributed to a groundbreaking study on hammerhead shark migration patterns, leading to new conservation efforts in the Galapagos. But the encounter with the territorial hammerhead remained etched in their minds, 
a powerful reminder of the unpredictable nature of fieldwork and the importance of respecting the ocean's most formidable predators. In the summer of 2003, snorkelers and scuba divers were drawn to Koh Tao, an island in the Gulf of Thailand off the coast of Thailand. It was renowned for its vivid coral reefs and glistening clear waters, and it was home to a wide range of marine life, including the elegant and ostentatiously shy blacktip reef shark. Travelers wishing to explore the underwater world had come to know the island as a secure place to go. However, on an abnormally warm July day, a snorkeling excursion would take a horrifying turn, giving its participants a sobering reminder of how unpredictable nature can be. Local guide Niran Kalaya led the tour, and he had a solid reputation due to his knowledge of the marine life in the area. He was joined by seven other tourists that day, all excited to explore the coral gardens surrounding Shark Bay, a location named more for its breathtaking view than for any potential danger. Two Americans, a German couple, and three backpackers from Australia were among them. Marjorie Thistle, a marine biology student from the UK who was traveling during her gap year, was the most notable person in the group. As the boat anchored close to the reef, the high sun created a shimmering glow on the water's surface. During his routine safety briefing, Niran emphasized the need to maintain composure in the presence of black-tip sharks, frequently spotted nearby. The sharks, he explained, were generally shy and avoided human contact. He had no idea that the circumstances of that day would lead to an experience he would never forget. The vibrant reef opened beneath them as the group slipped into the water, teeming with colorful fish and waving sea fans. The first sighting of a black tip shark sent a ripple of excitement through the group. The sleek, agile creatures glided gracefully through the water, their distinctive black-tipped fins easily cut through the current. Everything seemed perfect until Marjorie noticed something unusual. The sharks were acting erratically, darting back and forth in a way that suggested heightened agitation. Within minutes, the calm waters began to churn. The sharks, which usually kept their distance, started circling closer. Their movements became more aggressive, and they began targeting the group's snorkeling gear fins, masks, and even the boat itself. One of the Australian backpackers, Kieran Linklater, felt a sudden tug on his leg as a shark brushed past him, its rough skin grazing his calf. Panic began to spread through the group as they struggled to maintain composure. Niran quickly realized that something was very wrong. He had been leading tours in Shark Bay for years and had never seen the sharks behave this way. The normally passive creatures were now creating powerful currents with their frantic movements, pushing the snorkelers toward a section of the reef known for its sharp, jagged corals. The once vibrant underwater scene had transformed into a chaotic and dangerous environment. The group's situation worsened when the boat anchor became entangled in the reef, preventing them from quickly escaping. Niran, trying to maintain control of the group, signaled for everyone to huddle together and stay close to the reef wall. He knew that if they became separated, the risk of injury would increase dramatically. However, the sharks continued to circle, occasionally charging at the group before veering off at the last moment. The water was now a whirlpool of motion, and the once clear visibility had been reduced to a murky blur of sand and debris. Marjorie noticed that the sharks were more interested in the equipment than the people, even though she was terrified. Possibly a disturbance in their surroundings. She surmised that something had upset the shark's routine. The region had seen an increase in overfishing, and the recent degradation of the reef ecosystems had probably contributed to the unpredictable behavior of the sharks. She wondered if the sharks responded because they were undernourished or something had disturbed their usual hunting grounds. Niran had to make the difficult choice of trying to free the boat himself as things got out of hand. With the more aggressive sharks gathered near the surface, he instructed the group to stay as low as possible. He took a deep breath and dove toward the anchor line, swimming through the chaos with his heart racing. It took him multiple tries to finally free the anchor. But as he came to the surface, he noticed that Lotte Rehfeld, a German tourist, was drifting perilously near the jagged coral, fighting against the current. Lotta was dragged back toward the group by Marjorie, who moved quickly to her side and grabbed her arm. Thankfully, the sharks appeared uninterested despite the blood from a small cut on Lotus's leg mixing with the water. 
Now gathered in a group, they walked back to the boat slowly, Neron assisting each person in getting on board as soon as possible. There was an obvious sense of unease in the air, and any movement seemed certain to set off another round of shark aggression. After ensuring everyone was securely on board, Niran quickly returned to the island, his thoughts buzzing with inquiries about the events that had transpired. How the usually placid black tips behaved had gone against everything he had been taught about them. The sense that something more profound was going on also persisted in Marjorie. She mentally noted that she needed to look into the effects of habitat loss and overfishing on shark populations in the area as soon as they arrived at the coast. Authorities in the area, as well as marine biologists, launched an investigation into the incident. Over the next few weeks, it became evident that shark bays damaged reef structures and dwindling fish populations were probably the cause of the aggressive behavior displayed by the black tip sharks. The sharks had become hostile due to the disturbance of their natural habitat, perceiving the snorkelers and their gear as possible dangers or rivals for food. Stronger laws were implemented after the incident to safeguard the reef and restrict fishing. Niran kept giving snorkeling tours, but this time she emphasized informing guests about the value of marine conservation. The encounter stoked Marjorie's interest in marine biology, and she decided to focus her academic career on protecting delicate ecosystems like Shark Bay. The mayhem of that day was a sharp reminder of the precarious equilibrium between nature and humans, and the dire repercussions of tipping it too far. In the heart of the Florida Everglades, an ecosystem brimming with life, it was the summer of 2011. The Everglades have long been a haven for people hoping to get a close-up look at nature's delicate beauty. They are a mosaic of slowly flowing water and tangled mangrove forests. Its intricate mangrove tunnels were a marvel, peaceful and enigmatic and beyond its vast sawgrass prairies and cypress swamps. This was where a group of eco-tourists set out for an adventure, unaware of the danger that lurked beneath the waters. Theodore Theo Crevel, an experienced ecologist with over 20 years of experience organizing similar outings, led the tour. Five people were among his passengers. The wildlife photographer Penelope Marwin, the retired marine engineer JSEC Jack Harcourt, the Huxley siblings Daria and Nolan, and the daring college student Callum Breen. Together they set out on a half-day tour, marveling at the abundant biodiversity around them as their small motorboat twisted through the mangrove tunnels. The dynamics of the Everglades had been drastically altered by wetlands being drained, pollution, and habitat loss throughout history as a result of human activity. Predator-prey dynamics have changed requiring species to adjust to new environments. One thing, though, had persisted despite all of these modifications. Nurse sharks generally have submissive behavior. Nurse sharks, known for their peaceful and lazy disposition, were frequently spotted in the shallow waters of the Everglades. They rarely showed hostility toward humans and often rested on the seafloor. However, there was something different about this specific day. The water beneath the group was calm and dark as they meandered through an incredibly thick area of mangroves. Theo turned off the engine so visitors could enjoy the quiet surroundings. Penelope leaned over the side of the boat to capture a shot of a heron perched on a fallen branch, while Jack pointed out the mangrove roots that snaked into the water. The ship gave way suddenly to a violent rocking. When the movement grew fiercer, they initially believed it to be a submerged log or an inquisitive alligator. Theo immediately saw the culprit because he had a keen eye, a nurse shark aggressively circling the boat at least nine feet long. This wasn't like the usual. This nurse shark was unlike any other. They usually showed little regard for humans. It again struck the boat's side with unexpected force, sending water sloshing over the edge. Theo's face tightened in concern as he tried to restart the engine but the aggressive behavior of the shark was growing bolder. The shark's movements were erratic, as though it were defending something, perhaps a territory or a nest. The group watched in shock as the previously calm waters became a battleground, with the shark repeatedly ramming its thick, muscular body against the boat. Callum, eager to help, leaned over the side to get a better look, but the shark surged upward, its powerful jaws snapping inches from his hand. Theo yanked him back in time, shouting warnings about the shark's unpredictability. 
The group had no choice but to try and navigate out of the narrow mangrove corridor. But the shark's relentless pursuit made it difficult, and Theo struggled to get the motor running. As the minutes ticked by, the boat continued to take hit after hit. Penelope, normally composed behind her camera, gripped the ship's side, her heart racing. She had spent years documenting wildlife encounters but had never experienced anything like this. Jack, the retired marine engineer, offered suggestions to Theo to help him assess the situation. However, the confined space of the mangrove tunnels made maneuvering difficult. Daria and Nolan, the siblings, sat motionless, too afraid to move. Although their goal in coming was an adventure, this far exceeded their expectations. The shark appeared more determined each time it struck the boat. There were no more options available to the group. They needed to escape the narrow passage and reach the open water to gain speed and outpace the shark. Theo finally started the engine after what seemed like hours but was only minutes. Although the shark's aggression seemed to be decreasing, it followed them as he maneuvered the boat through the mangrove's many turns. As they dashed toward a more expansive stretch of the canal, the group held their breath. The attack ended as abruptly as it had begun when the shark continued to follow for more. The group was left stunned but alive as the shark vanished into the dark depths. Theo cut the engine as soon as they were in the open water. In silence, the group processed the events of the previous moment. Jack broke the tension by offering a wry grin and muttering something about nurse sharks needing better bedside manners, which was a joke that elicited a few nervous chuckles. Later, back on land, the group reflected on the incident. Theo, still shaken, discussed the possible reasons behind the nurse shark's uncharacteristic aggression. Habitat loss pollution and changes to the ecosystem have taken their toll on many species in the Everglades. Perhaps this shark had been pushed to its limits by environmental stressors, becoming territorial in a way unusual for its kind. It was a stark reminder of the unintended consequences of human interference with nature. The group stayed in touch in the following days, bonded by the strange encounter. Penelope's photos of the event were featured in several wildlife magazines alongside articles that raised awareness of the environmental challenges faced by the Everglades. Jack, always the practical one, sent Theo a new propeller for his boat, a quiet acknowledgement of the damage caused by their unexpected adversary. They left with a fresh appreciation for the delicate balance of nature and the knowledge that even the most peaceful creatures can turn violent when their world is in danger even though none of them would ever forget the unsettling experience. In the summer of 2008, warmer currents from the Indian Ocean met the chilly Atlantic waters near South Africa's coast. It was well into the season's third week for Janko Dewet's commercial fishing vessel, the Aquila. The boat's nets were already heavy with a possible catch, and the crew's target was a significant export for the region's fishing sector. Built for lengthy days at sea, the ship was a simple but reliable trawler operating out of the tiny port town of Lambert's Bay. Knowing the rhythms of the ocean and its many creatures, Day Wet and his crew worked in these waters for years. However, there was something different about this season. The second day of their journey was when the tension began to rise. Following an exhausting trawling night, the crew noticed odd activity in the water. Before the abrupt, forceful flailing of something far bigger, there were only a few splashes close to the nets. The first mate on board, Janik Van Royen, was the first to sound the alarm. He had observed fins slicing through the water, a reliable indicator that sharks were in the area. These were no ordinary sharks, though Makos are distinguished by their swiftness and ferocity. Initially, the crew dismissed it as a small irritation. The scent of fish and the easy meal that fishing nets offered drew sharks to fishing vessels regularly. However, it was evident that this was not your typical encounter as the sun rose. At least 12 Mako sharks had surrounded the Aquila and attacked the nets with incredible ferocity. Their sleek torpedo-shaped bodies darted through the water, severing the fishing gear with their strong jaws and smashing into the vessel's hull. Things had gotten worse by midday. The sharks had severely damaged the nets, tore enormous holes in them, and let the valuable hake return to the ocean. While the crew worked feverishly to repair the damage, the Makos returned each time they lowered the nets into the water. The situation started getting to Janko Dewet, a stoic man who had survived many storms and setbacks. 
Due to the short fishing season, every day they could not fish was a blow to their livelihood. The economic pressure was tremendous, with quotas to meet and contracts to be completed. The fact that the Aquila wasn't the only ship having this issue added to the tension. Other fishing boats in the area had reported similar encounters, and rumors were spreading that the Mako sharks were becoming more aggressive, perhaps due to changes in their natural prey or increased competition for food. The crew of the Aquila knew they couldn't afford to lose another full day of fishing, but the sharks weren't going anywhere. To find a solution, DeWet contacted Dr. Lyle Mbeki, a marine biologist from the University of Cape Town who studied shark behavior in the region for years. The reports intrigued Mbeki, a calm and methodical scientist, and arranged to meet the Aquila at sea. When she arrived with her team, she immediately began assessing the situation. She explained to the crew that Mako sharks were highly intelligent and often opportunistic hunters, drawn to the vibrations and smells of fishing activity. However, this level of aggression was unusual. Mbeki proposed a series of non-lethal deterrents that might help. Her team had been working on experimental acoustic devices that emitted high-frequency sounds designed to repel sharks without harming them. The crew was skeptical but desperate for a solution. They deployed the devices, hoping to drive the sharks away long enough to repair the nets and resume fishing. It worked for a little while. The sharks withdrew and began to circle at a distance, seemingly perplexed by the strange noises. The crew took advantage of the opportunity to fix the nets and prepare for another haul. However, the sharks reappeared and were even more hostile than before as they lowered the gear back into the water. A loud crack sounded throughout the deck as one of the larger Makos, a massive creature nearly four meters long, rammed the side of the boat. The crew became anxious as they hurried to protect the equipment and stop additional harm. Acoustic deterrence alone wouldn't be sufficient, Mbeki realized as he observed from the deck. She suggested that DeWet cease trawling and let the sharks naturally disperse for a day. But the captain knew that every lost day meant income for him and his entire crew. DeWet felt a great conflict between their need to protect the vessel and their financial circumstances. He and his men both had families to feed. They settled on a compromise following a contentious debate. The Aquila would head back to the coast and collaborate with the Mbeki's group on a more all-encompassing fix. Mbeki advised that in the interim, they think about changing their fishing methods to deter sharks, like switching to different nets and cutting back on waste that can attract predators. It was a dismal trip back to Lambert's Bay. The crew was worn out, and it would take days to fix the damage to the nets. DeWet, however, was aware that they needed to strike a balance between their way of life and the realities of the ocean. To him and his crew, the Mako sharks were an essential component of the ecosystem, not an enemy. As they docked at the harbor, DeWet vowed to work with Mbeki and other marine experts to develop sustainable fishing practices allowing them to coexist with the sharks, even if it meant adjusting their methods. The Aquila crew returned to sea in the ensuing weeks with refreshed knowledge and a renewed sense of purpose. While the crew had come to expect the Mako shark's presence, they were still present and actively searching the waters. Challenging the lesson would influence their fishing methods for many years. By the end of the season, the Aquila had met its quota, though not without challenges. The crew had survived the Mako shark menace and, in doing so, had become part of a larger conversation about the delicate balance between human industry and marine conservation.